Started. Are there any questions from the last time? You guys never have any questions at the beginning, which is fine. Even here now, we're approaching the last lecture. All right, so uh, last time uh, we discussed the uh, possible implications of biotechnology and other advances for uh, human health. And um, we explored the unresolved, I would say, unresolved debate between Sandel and Harris, Sandel and Harris, although I'm more on the Harris side. Um, he, and we discussed briefly, I didn't assign any readings, but we discussed briefly Hughes's argument about the hand-in-hand -hand nature of technology and democracy for human welfare. And we spoke a bit about the practical and moral problems raised by situations at the boundary between life and death, between people and animals, between people and machines, and so on. And today I'm going to be discussing whether people uh, uh, who have insurance in the United States, whether people have insurance, health insurance in the United States, and whether it makes a difference, and also a selection of public policy interventions that we might try in order to improve public health. Now, the, the class has been primarily about the social determinants of illness the last semester together. Uh, I've alluded to and I've shown you different sorts of policy interventions. You might rightly be asking, well, what can we do about this? to make the world better. We've talked about some of those things, but you should understand that you could take a whole class in healthcare policy, and then that would be all about sort of intervention strategies in full. Um, whereas we've been focusing primarily on the social determinants of health. So, um, so when we speak about health insurance, it's important to realize that we have indeed held, have had health insurance for everyone over 65, namely Medicare for decades, right? So the, the issue, the debate about the access to health insurance has been a non-elderly problem. Elderly people have had access to health insurance, not the best, but adequate uh, for, for you know, half a century. And it's fairly surprising to realize, however, that even now, after the passage of, uh, of the um, uh, ACA or the so-called Obamacare, I don't know, 15 years ago now, nevertheless, a large fraction of our population, 28 million Americans, lack health insurance. And in 2018, the percentage of persons uninsured at that time, of, at the time of interview, was roughly 9%. So maybe 9% of people at any given time don't have health insurance. And I don't know if any of you have ever needed to see a doctor or had a health problem and you wanted to go to a clinic or a hospital and you sort of taken it for granted that, that you could do that without necessarily having to, to pay for it because your insurance would cover it. Imagine if instead, if any of you have ever spent a night in an ER, uh, or broken a bone, or had an asthma attack, or a diabetic complication, or anything of that nature, it would cost a lot of money, like many thousands of dollars would be the bill to get such care, some money that you don't have. So what do poor people or uninsured people do in our country when they have health problems? How do they get health care? How's that handled? And the way we handle it in our society, as it turns out, is completely different from every other industrialized democracy. And in fact, coupled with the manifest inefficiency and inequity in the system, um, th th this, this fact that we were oddballs compared to the rest of the industrialized world and the fact that the system we then had was inefficient and unequal, uh, this prompted the passage of the Health Care Reform Act in 2010, which finally made a dent in our numbers. So if you look at what was happening in terms of health insurance in our country, you know, you guys were still in elementary school or whenever, 2010 was, yeah, you guys were, you know, you were kids. You weren't thinking about health insurance back then. Uh, but now you should be, uh, or you soon will be when you graduate from college. Uh, you know, there were all these uh, percentage of Americans that were uninsured. Finally, the ACA gets passed, and those numbers are brought down. But there's still about 9% of Americans, even now, um, you know, don't have health insurance. And the lack of insurance, of course, varies by age, especially people in your age groups. Of course, if you're 65 or older, you're almost almost always insured. There are a few exceptions, which I won't go into, tiny little percentage of people who fall through the cracks. Uh, but if you look at your age group over here, the percentage is higher. 
uh, even in 2018, 14.3%. Many of you, not many of you, some of you, when you graduate from college, will take jobs that don't offer health insurance. Right now, you're covered by Yale and so on. Some of you will work for large employers. Some of you might work for small nonprofits. Maybe you want to take a year traveling. Maybe you want to paint. Maybe you want to work uh, part-time or you get a job of some other kind and it might not have health insurance. And you probably haven't thought about what would happen if you got, heaven forbid, like leukemia during that year. You're 23 years old and you get your, or you have a schizophrenic break or you have some catastrophe or you're hit by a bus. What would happen to you? Who would care for you? Your parents, if, if they were wealthy enough, might have to spend hundreds, might have to sell their house or remortgage their house in order to have enough money to cover your care, which they probably, if they love you, would probably do. But, uh, but you know, why should you be in that situation? Why should uh, you be unable to access health care in a, in a rich democracy uh, such as ours? And not surprisingly, lacking health insurance results in significant reduction in the access to health care. So if you look at percentage of adults your age group, or you know, as close as possible, who did not get or delayed medical care due to cost, this is now older data, but it's roughly the same. And if you look, let's just start with, you know, looking at the base case of all races and ethnicities, you know, I don't know, whatever it is, 16% uh, report that they did not get or delayed medical care because they couldn't afford it. Uh, and then depending on, you know, of course, if you were uninsured, 30% of uninsured people simply, you know, didn't get some kind of care that they needed. There was a case that made the news, I don't know if you guys saw it recently, about a, a person with asthma that the insurance regulations about their EpiPens, maybe one of you might have a need for an EpiPen in the class this size, and, uh, and they no longer covered the kind of EpiPen he needed, and uh, he couldn't refill his prescription, and then he had an asthma attack and died. This young man died, your age, for lack of a device that would have saved his life, and that didn't cost a fortune because the insurance company you know, he was, wouldn't cover this at uh, whatever the point that was. Um, and of course, however, by now, we know um, that there could be confounding factors here associated both with not having health insurance and with not seeking medical care. So just for the sake of argument and in fairness to these numbers, maybe the people that like are incompetent, you know, like don't know how to organize their lives, uh, can't get health insurance and also can't organize themselves to go to the emergency room when they're sick. So maybe they're just messy people, okay? They just can't seek the care or the provisions that they need. So maybe it's not that the lack of health insurance is causing the lack of seeking health care. Some other trait is causing both not having health insurance and not seeking health care. That's possible. Maybe a small fraction of that is due to that, but probably not a lot of it. But more importantly, by this stage of the course, you should legitimately be unsure about whether medical care is the crucial determinant of health regardless, right? So here I am telling you how important it is, to, and many people will tell you this, and as usual with me, you're going to get a complicated picture over the next hour and 15 minutes. Uh, you know, by now you should be skeptical. So many people will tell you people should have health insurance, and they should, but maybe it doesn't make any difference. Maybe if I gave you insurance, since I've now, hopefully by this time, of course, broken down your fantasy that, you know, healthcare is a panacea and will fix any problems. If I give you insurance and you access the healthcare system, maybe it makes no difference in your health outcomes, in fact. Maybe doctors make no difference. Now, the United States is unusual uh, in its lack of public health insurance uh, for all. And it's actually quite backward. All these European countries have had compulsory health insurance, some for over 100 years. So Germany introduces it in 1883, Luxembourg in 1901, Norway 1909, Great Britain in 1911, along with Russia, Switzerland, and so on, Romania, Estonia, Bulgaria, all these countries for decades have had everyone covered under the same kind of national health insurance, which means that uh, you pay taxes to support the system, uh, of course, but then everyone is the right of citizenship has access to health care when they need it, which is paid for by the central pool of money that is collected uh, by virtue of taxes. We don't like, we don't require you to buy your own health insurance or have an employer. By the way, it's inefficient. It, it, Many people don't switch jobs because they don't want to lose their health insurance, okay? So it's actually inefficient from an economic point of view. If we are interested in labor market productivity, we're interested in migration and fluidity, we want people to be able to move to where jobs are. If, if, if we tie insurance to the job that you have, it's like an anchor that keeps you back. It's like a kind of constraint on the kind of freedom we would want in a system that would let labor move to wherever it, it's best used, for example. So you could even make an economic argument from a public policy point of view that it's optimal for the market as a whole for 
like we provide public education. We'll just provide public health insurance. We don't do that. Greece did it, I don't know, over 100 years ago, um, and so on. Now, the uh, a key provision for the uh, Uninsured Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, of, uh, or also called the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare of 2010, um, finally started to address this. This act was very complex, and it reflected political realities. And it was not perfect, but it was not bad either. So when you kid, people were, you know, I don't know, five or six, uh, this law was passed. And this is the world you've grown up in. Uh, and this, this law requires citizens and legal immigrants to have insurance. We're all required to have insurance. And it created state-based American health benefit exchanges through which individuals can buy coverage with various complex incentives. Now, you'll all be covered, another provision of the law, under your parents' insurance till you're 26. But once you hit 26, you're going to need to get your own insurance. Uh, and if you don't have a job that provides insurance, you're going to have to figure it out. And so you can buy it on these exchanges where you have to spend a few hundred dollars every month. So maybe nowadays have a decent insurance. If you live in New York City, it might cost you like $350 a month or something to buy such insurance or $500 a month, which is not so bad actually for the cost of health care. Although, you know, depending on your income, if you're a teacher or something, that might not be so great. Uh, but actually the real cost is higher because the government is supplementing that, that premium that you're paying is actually less than the actual cost. Um, this, this law had an individual mandate that was incentivized by a penalty. And what this means is, is that the law says you have to buy health insurance. And this was really hotly debated between the right and the left at the time. Uh, but the reason was obvious because if you didn't have an individual mandate, people would, uh, healthy people wouldn't buy the insurance, only sick people would buy the insurance and their rates would go up. Or even worse, people would buy into the insurance after they got sick. So no one would have any insurance then as soon as you fall sick, you would race to buy insurance to cover your care, which would be the worst possible way to design an insurance scheme, right? The whole point of insurance is that it spreads the risk. None of us knows which of us is gonna be struck by lightning. We all contribute a little bit of money. And then when one of us is struck by lightning, all the money goes to that person, right? Um, it required employers to provide coverage, again, with complex incentives, and it expanded Medicaid and Medicare in certain ways. So they, they kind of moved as everything a little bit to kind of increase the number of Americans that were covered. Uh, I think at the time about a third of Americans weren't covered and then it became 10% or something uh, after the law was passed. Actually, I have that um, in the next slide because here's how the act was forecast to affect the problem of the uninsured. And on the left, there were 162 million people in the employer market, 54 million were uninsured, 35 million people on Medicaid, 30 million in the non-group or other market, uh, and sort of small insurers. And after the reform on the right, you find that 22 million people are left uninsured. So the goal of the policy was to reduce this part of the pie, the green part, and it goes down from whatever I just said, uh, 54 million to 22 million after the insurance. So it worked. The plan got many more Americans uh, covered uh, by insurance. And then the uninsured category has gone from the second largest to the, to the smallest, in fact. And so the, and the population of the persistently uninsured includes a number of different categories of people. Illegal immigrants uh, are still uninsured. People who can't afford their insurance and aren't getting subsidies to help them purchase it. And some people who've decided to pay the penalty rather than purchase insurance. Uh, they may decide that that makes economic sense for them and that's just what they're gonna do. They're gonna run the risk. And having insurance, in fact, does increase the use of medical care. And the financial details of the kind of insurance you have influence how much medical care you use. We know this from a very famous experiment, the RAND Health Insurance Experiment, HIE, that was conducted a long time ago now in the 1970s. You'd be very hard pressed to do this kind of experiment again. And it involved 2,000 non-elderly families in various locations around the country. And the families were randomized to get various kinds of health insurance, including completely free care. So some fraction of the people, they said, no matter what care you need, you get it for free. Another fraction said, we'll pay for 25% uh, uh, of the cost, 50% of the cost, or 95% of the cost that you incur. And not surprisingly, the more people had to pay for their own care, the less of it they used. So you could look at, for example, under the free care plan, people had, I don't know, 4.55 visits per year. They had 0.128 hospital admits. 
87% of them used any care, and the total expenses in 1991 dollars was $982. And the more, the, the less, the more they have to pay themselves. I'm sorry, I reversed this earlier when I spoke. So this is free. This is you pay 25%. This is you pay 50%. This is you pay 95%. You know, the less care they use on all these axes. So giving people free access to doctors and hospitals, unsurprisingly, makes them use it more. Okay. But in the RAND health insurance experiment, when cost sharing was higher, uh, as we said, you, medical care was lower. But the question is, were people who use more medical care the better for it? Did it make a difference, right? Which is the key question and one by now you should have some skepticism about. So this showed free care versus cost sharing, the lack of effect on health status. So they looked at various health measures and they measured them like physical function on a score of one to 100. And in the free plan, that number was 85.3. And in the cost sharing plan, it was the same. So it didn't matter for this outcome, whether they had free insurance, free care or not. Mental health score, also indistinguishable. Smoking, indistinguishable. It wasn't like if you had free access to health care, you stopped smoking. The weight was uh, indistinguishable. Cholesterol level, indistinguishable. There was a small difference in diastolic blood pressure, maybe because the people on the free care plan had access to uh, antihypertensive medicines that lowered their blood pressure. So this is statistically significant. And a little bit of improvement in their far vision, maybe because they got free glasses, all right? Simple things that they got. Uh, and the risk of dying was no different. So health insurance in this study, for most clinical outcomes, had no effect, okay? No effect on the outcome. It affected whether you use the, use the healthcare system, but not whether the, you change your health, which by now shouldn't surprise you, okay? This outcome should not surprise you by now uh, in this class. Um, uh, so so uh, we must note having insurance is not a panacea. And access to medical care, let alone the proper use of medical care, should not be conflated with having insurance. Having health care access and having insurance are different things, let alone having health, which is a yet another thing. Now, a more recent natural experiment addressed the same topics. I can't remember. Let me see if I assign this paper or the next paper in the readings. Uh, let me see if I assign this one. No, this was not assigned, but a, a similar paper, which I'll get to in a moment, was assigned. Uh, the American, the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, expanded Medicaid coverage as part of the act in 2010 for low-income adults. But the likely effects of expanding the coverage were unclear. The 2008 Medicaid expansion in Oregon, which was based on lottery drawings from a waiting list, provided an opportunity to evaluate these effects. So in 2008, a couple of years before the ACA Act, Oregon said, we have enough money to give some poor people health insurance, but not everyone will use a lottery to assign it. And then they followed all those people forward, the people who were given a lottery to be given uh, uh, access to you know, health insurance versus those that were randomly assigned not to. And approximately two years after the lottery, data from 6,387 adults who were randomly selected to be able to apply for the coverage and 5,842 adults who were not selected were compared. And the scientists used a random assignment in the lottery to calculate the effect of Medicaid insurance coverage. And again, they found limited effects on physical health, but notable effects on mental health, healthcare use, and financial circumstances. So, uh, so this shows the Oregon insurance experiment, the effects on health, healthcare, and, and wealth. And these are the measures. And so we can look at the change and whether it was significant. And so people who had elevated blood pressure, they, uh, the mean value, uh, the percentage declined uh, in the, uh, if they were given access to health insurance, but it wasn't statistically significant. And their cholesterol in increased a little bit, but it wasn't significant. And glycosylated hemoglobin, which is this measure of diabetes management, went down a little bit, but wasn't significant. And depression went down a lot, uh, I don't know, nine percentage points, let's say from 39% to 30%, and that was significant. So people were less depressed when they had the insurance. Uh, the health quality of life ratings improved, and that was significant. Out-of-pocket spending went down. People spend less money, unsurprisingly, they had access. Uh, to healthcare, any medical debt went down substantially, and you guys should know that medical debt is one of the main drivers of poverty in our society, right? Poor people are destroyed 
by a help going to a hospital and a hundred thousand dollar bill and the hospitals will pursue you and you have to sell your house or your possessions or they repossess it's a total disaster uh current prescription drugs went up people can now fill their prescriptions office visits went up so there were more health care use and received all needed care uh went up so so some of the, again the people use more care uh there was some improvement in mental health but the physical measure is not a lot of difference okay and it's maybe not too surprising you're less depressed it's stressful not to have health insurance and to worry remember the thing guys you have to remember is that there are two different kinds of things that can happen to you there's a there's a kind of routine stuff you have asthma you break your finger you need uh, you know you twist your ankle you need some kind of routine care which all of us want but it's not going to kill you and then there's a catastrophe you know you're hit by a bus or or, or uh, uh, you know you have an anaphylactic reaction to something where you could die right and that's the main thing we all would want insurance for right the protecting us from a catastrophic thing we couldn't cover or you know if you had an asthma attack and you needed to go see a doctor maybe you don't go to the ER and have a three thousand dollar bill maybe you go to a doc in a box and have a two hundred dollar bill and you decide to pay you don't have much money but you can pay at least but there's nobody that can afford no one except super rich people can afford treatment for leukemia okay and so you know people get worried about that like what would I do if my my children or myself got seriously uh, ill in short, this study showed that Medicaid coverage generated no significant improvements in measured physical health outcomes in the first two years, but it did increase the use of health services, raise rates of diabetes detection and management, lower rates of depression, and reduce financial strain. And it's unclear if the long-term effects would be different, which they well might be, or whether in such a poor population, the real threat to health is something else altogether rather than the access to medical care, as we've also repeatedly seen. In other words, what's really killing poor people is poverty, not lack of health care. So even if we fix the lack of health care problem in the fundamental causes paradigm that we discussed, it doesn't help them, right? They're still suffering because, let's say, they're at the bottom of the pyramid. Here's another analysis of the benefits of health insurance, examining cancer detection and mortality per 100,000 people among people just above and below the age of 65, in the United States over the period from 2001 and 2015. And it relies on a kind of little trick called regression discontinuity. So in other words, it says like, we're gonna compare people and what happens to them when they're 64 and a half to people who are otherwise the same and are 65 and a half. Now they're not exactly the same because they're one year difference, but they're just below and just above a cut point where they would automatically be granted health insurance because they age into Medicare. So if we compare those two groups, we can kind of get an estimate of what's the impact of getting Medicare insurance by doing this sort of uh, natural experiment. And I don't think this was one of the assigned readings either, but I'll get to the one that I assigned. I don't, you should be grateful that I didn't assign all of these uh, to you. Um, and it considers three tumor sites for which screening, you guys are tired. I'm not getting any kind of re reactions from you today. <laughs> Have you all been out like protesting and stuff or listening to the drums? What is, what's been, uh, okay, well, anyway, it's the end of the semester and you're just counting the days. Um, this considers three tumor sites for which screening is recommended both before and after age 65, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer. And at age 65, cancer detection increased by 72 per 100,000 population among women and 33 per 100,000 population among men. And cancer mortality also decreased by nine per 100,000 population for women and it did not significantly change for men. So what we see is if we look at cancer detection among women, all of a sudden, people that are over 65 were detecting a lot more cancers. And it's not because there's like a smooth rise in cancer detection with age, which also could happen. You know, as you get older, you're more at risk for cancer. Bang, there's a big step up, which means that something about the insurance that was given at that age is driving that change. And this is what happens for women and men. And here, there's a little tiny drop. I don't know if you can see it from where you sit. So here, here, mortality for women for cancer is rising. And then right at 65, bang, it drops a little bit, as if giving people health insurance saves their lives, right? Help, keeps them from dying from cancer. There's no change for the men. You see, there's just a smooth, continuous rise. It makes no difference to the men whether you give them health insurance or not. They don't get better. It doesn't drop or, or go up. So the picture is complex, in fact, right? I've shown you now three or four studies, really well-designed studies, trying really hard to estimate the impact of health insurance on various outcomes. And this now, finally, is a finding taken from your readings. 
These authors evaluated a randomized pilot study in which the Internal Revenue Service sent informational letters to 3.9 million taxpayers who paid a tax penalty for lacking health insurance coverage under the Affordable Care Act. And in drawing on administrative data, it studied the effect of the intervention on taxpayers' subsequent health insurance enrollment and mortality. So we're going to mail these things to you guys and see whether then you enroll in the, uh, in the, in the health insurance, now that I've reminded you, and what happens uh, whether you live or die subsequently in a very large sample of people who did and did not get uh, these letters. And they found that the intervention led to increased coverage in the two years following treatment, meaning sending the letter, and that this additional coverage reduced mortality among middle-aged adults over the same time period. So this slide shows the difference in cumulative mortality uh, and across time uh, when they send the letter and that they find that the mortality uh, is, that the difference is going up. In other words, people are living longer after they have been reminded to buy health insurance. So this study, which was in your readings, uh, is, a confirm is a study that is in conflict with some of the other studies I've shown you, which shows that it is beneficial for this very important health outcome if you give people health insurance, at least middle-aged uh, people as in this study. In the two years following the intervention, the rate of mortality among previously uninsured 45 to 64 year olds was lower in the treatment group, those to whom the letter was sent, than in the control group by approximately 0.06 percentage points, or one fewer death for every 1,648 individuals in the population who were sent the letter. So we could send out whatever we sent out, 3.9 million letters, about one, we saved about one in a thousand or one in 2,000 people's lives, so that several thousand lives were saved just by sending out letters and reminding them to get uh, health insurance. Okay, so that's the health insurance topic. Really exciting topic, isn't it? Let's turn now to an overview of a variety of public health options or public policy options to affect public health, some of which we've already explored in the course. So what are some policy options? And we have indeed talked about these at various stages of the class. Uh, taxation uh, is very powerful. You know, taxes on cigarettes, for example, reduce consumption. Funding, how we allocate resources, makes a difference, how we spend our money in our society. Laws, prohibiting, you know, requiring bike lanes or, or requiring parks or prohibiting, you know, regulating the production of pollution. Education, giving people information through advertising or marketing. Network and community-based interventions, we've seen a bunch of those, especially more recently. Or nudges, which I'm going to discuss more today, which are sort of soft touch, gentle kind of paternalistic uh, interventions that the state might do to help shape the behavior uh, of the citizenry. Um, so maybe one focus of our interventions should be on increasing healthcare quality. How can we make the healthcare that we do deliver better? What might be done to achieve this objective? Maybe if we could align incentives between providers and payers and patients uh, better by returning money according to whether the patient was cured or not. So one idea, and this is, a, this is an old one it turns out, is to pay providers only if the patient gets better. This is known as paying for quality. So instead of just paying doctors to do stuff, maybe we'll only pay them when they do stuff successfully, when they do stuff well, um, and, and has been advocated. And when, and, 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 and when this has been advocated and carried to its logical extreme, it means that you only pay for proven success. So this, this is a you know, old ad, it says, feel better or your money back. All headaches instantly cured or your money is refunded. Well, that's a pretty damn good guarantee from this healthcare provider who says, okay, you know, I'll give you my money and I'll take these pills and if they don't work, you get the money back. That should incentivize me to make medicines that actually fix your headaches. Of course, what's going on here? Your headaches are gonna get better anyway, so you, know, you don't have to return the money. In other words, I can rely on the fact, this is like all the old treatments for syphilis. Most primary syphilis, which presents as genital warts, heals anyway. So whatever medicine that they used to give them in the olden days, the people thought it worked, but it didn't work. It's just that's the cor natural course of primary, secondary, tertiary syphilis. You guys know about this? Nobody knows about syphilis anymore. Anyway, <laughs> syphilis is a disease which goes through phases. Primary syphilis is the, after the initial contact, you have these little genital warts that erupt. 
and they regress. I forgot the time period. Over a couple of weeks, they just go away on their own. So in the olden days, people would sell medicines for the pox, the Spanish pox, the French called it, the French pox, the Spanish called it. And, uh, and, uh, and they would apply the, the salve or the pills, whatever they were doing, and then they got better and they thought it worked. But it actually had nothing to do with the medicine, which didn't work. It just was that was a natural course of the disease. Then syphilis comes back, a so-called secondary syphilis, and then it also tends to go away. And then it finally comes back in a deadly form called tertiary syphilis, which affects the brain and the heart and so on. Anyway, paying for quality. Uh, in this case, uh, most headaches go away on their own anyway, so the doctor or the, 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 the person selling the medicines could keep their, uh, their money. But as I said, this idea is very old. This is a contract between a patient and a doctor from Genoa almost a thousand years ago, from 1244. And so this is a, they're signing a contract, the doctor and, and the patient. And it says, In the name of the Lord, Amen, I, Rogerio de Bruc of Bagamo, promise and agree with you, Basso the wool carter, to, retain you, to return you to health and to make you improve from the illness that you have in your person, that is in your hand, foot, and mouth, in good faith, with the help of God, within the next month and a half, in such a way that you will be able to, very specific now, what am I going to do for you? In such a way that you will be able to feed yourself with your hand and cut bread and wear shoes and walk and speak much better than you do now. Who knows what uh, ba poor Basso had? What disease? No, no, that's a good guess. We're very good. No, he had a stroke, right? He can't use his hand and foot and he can't speak. This is a stroke. And the guy's saying, I'm going to cure you of your stroke. Some strokes get better with time, and so maybe he would collect on it. Or maybe not. And he goes, I, shall, I, the doctor, shall take care of all the expenses that will be necessary for this. And at that time, you will pay me seven Genoese, Genoese lira. And you shall not eat any fruit, beef, pasta, whether boiled or dry, or cabbage. If I do not keep my promise to you, you will not have to give me anything. And I, the aforementioned Basso, promise to you, Rogerio, to pay you seven Genoese lira within three days after my recovery and improvement. That really aligns incentives, doesn't it? Uh, imagine if all of the doctors today, you only, they only got paid if they actually made you better. And here are some more recent examples from a broad range of conditions where this type of idea is being brought back. In 1994, Merck offered refunds to patients who had been prescribed finasteride if they required surgery for benign prostatic hyperplasia after a year of treatment. This is, you know, your prostate gets bigger. In men, it compresses the urethra. Urinary retention, if you've ever had a urinary tract infection, you know what I'm talking about. It's very painful. Uh, and, uh, but, we, and, uh, but now we're not going to operate on your prostate to deal with this problem. We're going to give you this medicine, which shrinks your prostate. And uh, if you need surgery, then you give us the money back that you paid for the medicine. 1995, Sandoz introduces a money back guarantee for a cl uh, uh, clozapine for the treatment of resistant schizophrenia. Uh, 98, Merck promised to refund prescription costs if simvastatin plus diet did not help lower LDL cholesterol to target uh, concentrations identified by doctors, to target concentrations identified by doctors. Novartis launched a no-cure, no-pay initiative for Valsartan for hypertension. Lilly launched a no-cure, no-pay for um, Tadalafil for erectile dysfunction in the United States. Patients who are not satisfied with the treatment were issued a voucher for the free oral treatment of their choice if, they, if the 2004, in, in this period, if this so, uh, uh, Viagra-type drug didn't work. Bayer uh, launched a no-cure, no-pay initiative uh, for another drug. They had to get in the action here and also provide guarantees. Merck promised to return money if patients' diabetes does not meet goals. Novartis will refund money if patients are hospitalized with Spartaking and Tresto, a drug due to treat congestive heart failure. And most recently, actually there are other examples, but this is where the slide ends. 2017, Amgen will fully refund money to patients insurer if the patient suffers a heart attack or a stroke despite taking Repatha to lower cholesterol, which they want to charge $16,000 a year for. Okay, so they've done some assessments. They say, well, is it going to work, the drug or not? What can we charge for it? Pay us the money. If it doesn't work, we'll refund, we'll refund the money. So this idea is being, being um, resurrected. And it's not a bad policy idea, actually. Advocates for this idea suggest ways of evaluating good circumstances, like when should we try this policy? Well, first of all, we need something where simple methods can be used to measure the effect. Blood tests, for example, or the patient can report if they have erections, or you can see you know, if, if they have been hospitalized or not. That's pretty obvious. Um, or, and also whether the patient and the general practitioner can see the effects for themselves. You know, They can actually see it. 
And this idea continues to get attention. For example, very recently, Bluebird Pharma has suggested charging for its gene therapy for thalassemia this way. In other words, only if the hemoglobin improves or transfusions decline. And I don't think this idea is likely to be implemented on any meaningful scale, at least not yet, but I think it's very rational and I think it would work. Plus it's provocative to think about. For example, how would we determine efficacy and who would get to decide? And what is efficacy anyway? Maybe patients feel they're better, but they're not better. And how do patients determine efficacy nowadays? Maybe they're, and as we saw when we talked about the social construction of illness, what the doctor thinks and what the patient thinks may be very different. Which should, we, which should we incentivize here? Maybe there are elements of this idea, such as paying for quality of care, that would in fact be worth implementing. Maybe hospitals should be paid different amounts of money. If you take care of a patient with a heart attack and you do really well, you get more money than if you pay, take care of a patient with a heart attack and don't do so well which could be judged by you know, how big the heart attack is or whether the patient lives or dies. If you take care of a patient with a heart attack and they die, you get nothing. If you take care of a patient with a heart attack and they live, you get more. That would align incentives between me, the patient, my insurer, and the healthcare provider. Another idea to improve medical care is to pass more laws regulating the actual practice of medicine or patients' interactions with the healthcare system. And we saw some examples of this in the domain of tobacco and seatbelt use earlier in the course, where we have legislation that, that pres uh, prescribes these things. The issues are different, of course, when we are trying to legislate certain kinds of behaviors uh, in doctors. And, and such laws are very rare. For example, there are some laws that require doctors to, uh, with respect to mammogram reporting. So there were all these disasters where women had mammograms and the doctors negligently didn't inform them of their mammogram results and there was a cancer growing. Finally, the cancer gets big. Now the woman dies, okay? And, and the women are saying, why didn't anyone tell me I had a mammogram? I just fell through the cracks. We're sorry you're dead. Uh, no, that didn't seem very good. So laws were passed that said all women must be informed of their mammogram results in very specific ways. Or um, laws regarding advanced directive counseling. Some of you, I'm sure, if you've ever been, if you've, raise your hands if you've ever spent a night in a hospital. Some of you have. Okay. You, do you remember that you were asked to sign forms about advanced directives, like what should be done, who should speak for you if you're unable to speak for yourself, and what kind, would you like life support withdrawn under certain circumstances, and so on? Those were all laws that were passed in the last 20 years that required all patients admitted, doctors or healthcare workers, had to talk to patients. Um, and such laws, nevertheless, however, remain relatively rare, except for the regulation of research. Uh, but there are a bunch of laws. Uh, many laws regarding the vaccination of children, which we alluded to, reporting of mammography, reporting of infectious diseases. This is why you guys don't know about syphilis, in addition to not being doctors, is that whenever you care for people with infectious diseases, if you're a physician, there's mandatory reporting to the state. Why? Because it's an infectious disease. Your illness affects the risk of death of others. The state gets involved. And laws regarding information provision, uh, advanced directives, breast cancer treatment options, abortion services. This is very politically contested. Laws saying what you can or cannot say uh, uh, to uh, pregnant women uh, who either might want to keep the baby or not keep the baby. Uh, you know, this is regulated in many states now. And this is a complicated area given longstanding concerns with preserving physician professionalism. We also in this course have discussed how we want doctors to have a sense of agency. We want them to feel like they are moral agents, that they themselves are the actors. We don't want them to be automatons, right? We don't want doctors to treat you with a cookbook. You go to the doctor and they say, okay, let me look you up here. Uh, okay, you're this kind of patient, you have this problem. Okay, here's what you need. That's dumb, right? I mean, an AI model could do that. Actually, maybe it will get better, I don't know, than real doctors. But, uh, but you wanna see a doctor who'll treat you as a human being, take you into consideration and use their judgment to take care of you. So we don't want to like make doctors automatons by regulating everything. On the other hand, we don't want doctors to forget to do stupid or simple things. Uh, so anyway, the point of this slide, the previous slide had to do with financing of care. This one, a little bit about the financing. This one is just a quick like teaser about legislation. You could literally take a whole class in health law uh, and, uh, and learn many of aspects of this. How about making information more widely available? Uh, this is another possibly low cost way of improving health and healthcare. And the internet is doing just that. And as a result, it's leading to radical changes in the doctor patient relationship. So this is very old study now, uh, 20 years old, and the numbers have only gotten more 
you know, worse is not the right number, greater since then, 40% of people with internet access use it to get health information. Probably it's closer to 80% now. Everyone uses it to get health information. 48% of those with a chronic illness felt internet use improved their understanding of their condition. There's no doubt that you have a better understanding of your problems if you search online for what other people have said about your problems. 27% of those with a chronic illness felt internet use improved their ability to manage their condition by themselves. And, uh, and uh, 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 unsurprisingly, I mean, information is a very powerful tool. And, um, and, and in the interval of time, there have been countless online patient sites and wikis. You can, any condition you have, you can find a large group online that is trading information about doctors to care for the condition, treatments for the condition, side effects, complications, and so on. Yes, Joseph. Yes, this is very likely a silly question, but yeah. so this, this paper was from 2003. And yeah. In 2024, there's like a lot more more quality content on the internet. Um, like, for example, I, I know a lot of people in our generation need WebMD for like say you have cancer or any reasons. Yeah, WebMD is not so bad. You think WebMD is bad? Uh, there's like a joke that you're like, if you have a headache and you ask what you would say that you have cancer. Um, oh yeah, that's a different problem. But the information on web, like to me, I've used WebMD. The information is not wrong. It may alarm you and uh, and uh, you know may lead you to the worst uh, possibility, which it shouldn't. I, I guess. I, I thought you were going to bring up some quack sites, you know, like oh, no, no, like no, no, in no, put no. Chlor Clorox, you, you know, behind yeah, to oh, treat, yeah. you know, like our former <laughs> president recommended. Yeah. Like information Sexual overload or yeah. hypochondria from it. Yeah. I'm sure there have been. I don't, I'm sure this has been studied. I don't know offhand, but yes, I'm sure it's been studied. There are different classes of problems here. There's like access to correct information. So like the Mayo Clinic website is a reputable website. Uh, you know, they're a reputable website. MGH does a good healthcare site. WebMD is not bad. There's another one I'm blocking on the name right now. We can get accurate information, but you know, the person on the street may not be fully able to distinguish what's going on. There are also, there's a, what is it called? There's a fantastic resource available to doctors. I used to subscribe to it years ago, I can't remember, which is maintained by doctors and it's updated and it's very good. But yes, I'm sure there's a lot of inaccurate information. And then there's the second thing is that even with accurate information, the person on the street may not be able to digest it and know what to make of it. Yeah. My daughter, who's 26, will call me very alarmed, just like the story you told. I'm like, no, sweetie. You know, that's just, that's just that uh, you have a toothache, you know, you don't have brain cancer. Uh, so, um, and she went to Yale, by the way. Uh, so, you know. Um, all right. Uh, so, and, and, but one of the things that's happening is that patients come into the office with more knowledge and they can gather experiences and interact with other patients all over the world. And they can get non-medical perspectives on their treatments and second guess their doctors. And they can also band together and advocate politically to change the nature of practices in our country. So, you know, this is quite a dramatic change, this the way the internet has democratized the access to information. And in fact, the population of people who are older than 65, uh, you know, has increased dramatically in the last 20 years. And these individuals will, for a variety of reasons, including increased access to medical information, patients' rights movements, like the right to die movement we talked about earlier in the course, and the consumer choice movement, you know, this increasing idea, which is always ascendant in our society, you know, the consumer, the customer is always right, will bring increased sophistication to their healthcare encounters. Some have argued that this has or will accelerate the movement um, and awareness of self-care and wellness and will irreversibly alter the traditional doctor-patient relationship. Like the optimistic take on your question, Joseph, is that this is empowering to patients and they're going to rise to the occasion and take responsibility for their own Care and that this will change you know, how doctors and patients uh, interact. And in some ways, the internet will help us realize the vision articulated by uh, Ivan Illich. Many lectures ago, this is a favorite, favorite professorial maneuver here. I'm assuming you guys see what I'm doing. Uh, so this is, in many ways, the internet will help us realize the vision articulated by Illich, putting health and health information in the hands of the people, right? Illich was really pissed, didn't want the doctors to have control of human experience. So now if you make information widely available, maybe ironically, the same technology that Illich deplored in tools for, uh, in, in some of his other books on, um, that were sort of attacking 
modern capitalism and technologies, those tools actually paradoxically may actually be helping with the problem that we discussed in Medical Nemesis. Other policies we might implement might direct themselves to patients rather than doctors and might be preventative rather than curative in nature. This is one of my favorite and simplest examples taken from your readings and embodying a nudge. Okay? So here what the investigators did was they pl simply placed signs in a large shopping mall and watched how they affected 17,900 shoppers over the course of three months. And the signs said they were just little signs that you could buy for like five bucks at home at Office Depot. And they put a simple message on the sign, your heart needs exercise, use the stairs. Or improve your waistline, use the stairs. And they just put these in front of the escalators. And they said, you know, how many shoppers use the stairs? So if you look at all shoppers, at baseline, 4.8% of people, and then they, they hired undergraduates to hide behind plants and, and look at people and hit little, little tick, I hired undergrads to do stuff like this, and they hit little tick marks, in fact, well, never mind, uh, and, and they hit little, you know, check, okay, who comes up and then walks to the stairs, which I can see over there, and who takes the escalator, 4.8% did it baseline by using the health benefit sign, 6.9% of people overall use the stairs, or 7.2% with a weight control sign. And this varied, you know, according to they, whether they were young or old, whether they were male or female. So let's look. It looks like uh, it looks like uh, women had a big more of a response uh, than men did. Uh, it, it, uh, it didn't matter if they were overweight or not. If they were overweight, uh, it looked like they had a big bigger absolute effect. Uh, it matter between blacks and whites. Uh, blacks. Uh, looks like blacks got pissed at the health benefits sign and said, "Damn it, I'm going to take the escalators." <laughs> Uh, but they went out with a weight control sign or whatever. These are not statistically significant. They're just, you know, some numbers here. But the point is, these very simple signs had an effect. And in some ways, these results are too good to be true. Because think about the cost effectiveness of this. If each sign and easel cost about 60 bucks, it would cost about $200,000 to place a sign at every single regional mall in the United States, in the whole country. And if only 4% of shoppers use the stairs in each of these malls, Roughly 1.6 million more Americans would take the stairs each day compared to before. And the caloric cost of walking up and down two flights of stairs each day, as we also learned a few lectures ago, was about five calories per flight. And that would amount to a weight loss of up to five pounds for an average man over the course of a year. I mean, that's unbelievable. We get millions of Americans to lose five pounds just by putting these little signs up for $200,000 in our whole country. It's almost too good to be true. But this is the idea. Yeah, Liz. Very good. So after a while, we would just ignore. That's right. So the first time. I don't remember in this study, because it's been a while since I read it, whether they looked at decay with time since they did the intervention. And part of the problem is new people might show up. So you would need to look at repeated exposures. Like the first time I saw the sign, I did it. So over the course of the three months, you would need to somehow be able to track that Merritt came in the first month and, uh, and saw the sign and then walked up the stairs. And the next time she came two months later, she said, nah, it's stupid, I'm gonna take the escalator. Because otherwise we wouldn't know. Merritt comes the first month and takes the stairs, and then Sophia comes the third month and she takes the stairs and we don't know what's going on. That's a very good question. So I absolutely think the novelty, and we'll come back to that in a minute with some of the nudges, because I think that plays a role. Yes, uh, Lucy. I was just wondering if anyone had done some kind of study like this with like the Apple Watch, like standing up vendors yes. or things like that. I don't know how locked down that be. People have, I don't know, I'm sure it's been done with the Apple Watch, I just don't know offhand, but it's been done with all kinds. Like I use a Whoop device and, uh, and, and, and actually it was founded by one of my former students, uh, Whoop. So Will Ahmed is a former student of mine, the CEO of the company. And, um, and uh, it's, people have looked at the impact of these types of wearable technologies and they're generally very positive. I would say there's a fraction of people who take it off, ignore it, don't use it anyway, but I think in the group that is randomly assigned to use this device versus not, having this visibility in your healthcare really, in your in your fitness really, you know, has an impact. Plus, it gives you all these annoying messages, you know, go to sleep now and do all of these things. Does anyone use a Whoop other than me? So you can buy, you can subscribe to it. It's a super cool. You do? No, nobody uses a Whoop. Do you, does anyone use any kind of Fitbit or wearable? You're all young people, so you don't care. Let's go. Are you an athlete? Oh, you use the Apple Watch. Yeah, you track all this stuff. Yeah. Anyone else? You over here, raise your hand. Yeah. What, and you have an Apple Watch too? I have an Apple Watch, yeah. 
And you use the fitness stuff? Yeah. And, and you, does, it, it, does it change your behavior a little bit? Yeah. yeah. And you can, like, compete with your friends and family. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, that's right. So you can compare. Like I have a little fitness group with my sister, and you can actually you can sign up for a. Oh, this is too much information. Uh, and you, can, you know, middle-aged Greek men in Greece. You know, there's a long list of people, and you can like compete and stuff. It's crazy. Strangers. I don't care what strangers in Greece are doing in terms of this. But let's look at some of these nudges. Um, this is another example of nudging that was advocated by uh, Thaler and Sunstein. Uh, based on basic psychological principles. Nudges are, just to be clear, nudges are simple changes in structure that affect agency in lightly paternalistic ways. That's what a nudge is. We're going to modify the structure to change how people on their own exercise their judgment. And they're often very ingenious, right? So if you want to get people to slow down, maybe you just do this little cute inventive thing where you paint, you know, the peanuts uh, here in this way, and it looks like they're walking across the street. People slow down when they see it. Maybe eventually, Liz, after the fifth time, they just run over these cartoon characters because <laughs> so the novelty's worn off. But you know, at least initially, it has some effect. Yes. Well, you're double teaming me here, Justin and Joseph, at the same time. Uh, yeah. Uh, do you know have, have they stick there between like an individualized nudge, like something like Yahoo, Law, for example, where you have like a, a signal that's tailored to your specific uh -huh. behaviors versus like. Um, the influence of like structural nudge, for example, in design or like crosswalk. I remember seeing somebody like they, they, they didn't do anything, they just measured the weight every minute, and then they started losing weight just by looking at the weight every minute. Yes. Um, because they like implicitly changed their behaviors. Yes. The weight. Yes. Um, is, does that, you know, I mean, if there has been research, does that be more effective? I don't know. I'm sure there's been research on this topic, but I don't know the answer uh, to whether. I, I think probably the individual one would be more efficient on a per person basis, but probably perhaps less cost effective. You know, you could afford to do a group nudge, you know, and hit a lot of people and have a weaker effect on each person, but a, maybe a bigger total effect per dollar, um, if I had to guess. But I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, Justin. There certainly is a harm reduction aspect to this, I guess, like when you slow down, like less, yeah. less chaos, less likely to create a stampede. But at the same time, it seems possible to me that like harm creation occurs because people pay more attention like, down on the road. Which, like, so you think they're going to run into someone because they're looking at that? Well, more, well, that, and also, like, they might not look at the cars that are, like, passing by. Um, oh, okay. So when, when you create, like, both harm and reduce it in some yes. way, you kind of compare, you know, Yeah, you would have to, it, from a public health point of view, you have to be strictly utilitarian. Okay. The same thing happens with vaccines, right? The whole point of vaccines is one in a million people die as a result of the vaccine, but we save 10,000 lives. So that's a bargain we take. Um, it's a bargain. And yes, we run that risk. Other questions? I'm going to show you more nudges now. There are lots of them. There, some of them are just hilarious. So to stop gum from winding up where it doesn't belong, you give it the right place to belong, right? It's a very simple you know, nudge. Stick your gum here. You know, which actor did not star in Ocean's Eleven? I don't know if you guys know who didn't star in Ocean's Eleven. Uh, or, you know, stick your gum here. Marmite. Do you guys know what Marmite is? Raise your hand. Who, okay, who does not know what Marmite is? A few people. It's Okay, so in a minute I'll tell you what it is. Those of you that do know, who likes it? Okay, this is already telling you the answer to your question. Three out of like the 30 people who've ever had it. And who doesn't like Marmite? So gross. My, my wife loves it because she went to British boarding school when she was a girl. That's what she did. It's like a yeast extract. It's like the grossest thing. And they, the Brits eat it. And, and Australians, I think, eat it too. Maybe so. It's just the grossest thing. Anyway... So most of the people will not like it, in my view. And nudges often exploit social pressure. One of you already mentioned it. Take your litter home. Other people do. There was a very famous experiment that was published. I should put a slide on it, actually. A few years ago, uh, they, they, uh, they um, randomly assigned, they looked at, like, you know how now when you stay in a hotel, it says if you don't, if you don't want your towel to be laundered, save the earth, you know, or hang it up on the, on the hook here. In the olden days, when you stayed in a hotel, every day they would give you new bedding, which you know generated a huge amount, and new towels generated a huge amount of laundry. They did a randomized controlled trial where they, uh, they one control group that got nothing, another group got a sign that said "Save the Earth," you know, don't you know, you know, use your towels the second day, uh, or another one that said "55 percent of previous occupants of this room used their towels the second day uh, versus did not," and they found that the social pressure, the social norming 
one was more effective, was extremely effective. And you guys are, you guys will witness this in all aspects of your lives where you do things. I was talking to one of you earlier today. You do things because your friends do them, not necessarily because you believe them or have formed an independent opinion about whether it's a wise thing to do or not. So social pressure is really important. Sometimes social pressure can involve threats. Okay. So I'll let you guys study uh, what's going on here. <laughs> I just love it. the little YouTube video. So, you know, so, you know, if you do public urination, we're videotaping it and we're going to post it on YouTube. So, you know, give that some thought rather than, than this sign, you know, and you could do like we saw a randomized control trial uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Do you remember that paper from a view? You could, if you were an inventive student at Yale and you wanted to see some behavior, you could, for nothing, you could design this experiment and do it, you know, in the laundry room, put up a sign for a few weeks here and then replace it with a different sign and then observe what students do or water consumption or something. Or, you know, you could randomly assign Trumbull and, and Hopper College to different treatments or whatever. It's a very easy experiment to do. They don't cost a fortune and you could easily see which is more effective uh, in this type of situation. Or developing the urination theme, uh, here's an, a way to incentivize staying on target. Uh, you just give the men something to uh, aim at. And uh, it actually, I don't mean men's, public restrooms are completely gross uh, and uh, there's urine everywhere because God knows people don't care or can't aim or whatever the hell it is. Uh, so, you know, this, you know, this could be kind of a cutesy way to nudge people's behavior at very low cost. But even this idea, which you might think, God, that's, you know, really a really modern idea. Uh, no, this is an old idea. This is Napoleon when he was in power. You could buy a chamber pot uh, with a little ceramic Napoleon in it so you could piss on the emperor uh, whenever you wanted. Uh, you know, in the in the chamber pot. Um, and this one is not so subtle. Uh, this was an advertisement for uh, Adabreen, um, which is an anti-malarial drug in Papua New Guinea during World War II. These men didn't take their Adabreen. Uh, you know, that kind of sends a pretty powerful uh, message. Sometimes nudges need to be thought through carefully to avoid <laughs> unintended side effects. Okay. So too cool for drugs, cool to do drugs, do drugs, and just drugs, you know, as you, uh, as you wind down the pencil. So this was not, you know, well thought through. This little, let's get kids to stop using drugs by printing an anti-drug message on their pencils. Um, uh, and here's an invented example from Sweden, similar uh, to the intent of placards in the malls. Let me just play this for you. You guys can have a look at it. You'll see. I mean, there's like an incredible overlap. Like some, some of my former students have gone into architecture and you know, they've been interested in architecture for health. And there's so many inventive ways we could reshape our environment to improve our lives, make us happier and healthier. I mean, that's, you know, that costs some money, but look, think about that. And I think this, there might not be a lot of extinction, Liz. In other words, I think that's a kind of playful, fun thing. You might, every time you go, you'll pick, I'll climb up this little, the, the, you know, the piano stairs rather than go up the uh, escalator. 
And there are many ways you can begin to think if you're really creative about how to change our structure to affect our, our agency. And here's an example of how the built environment is ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this is really <laughs> preposterous. You know, you're going to the gym and you can take this little escalator up the last minute before you actually go and work out, right? I mean, this is like so American, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and as we saw earlier, even a slight increase or decrease in the average caloric intake can have huge uh, population level effects. This figure, again, the professorial move from several lectures ago, uh, shows the median of the distribution of estimated energy accumulation that accounts for the observed weight gain of about two pounds per year in, Americans 20 to, in American 20 to 40 year olds, which amounts to only 15 kilocalories per day or of the flight of stairs we just discussed. If we could just get Americans to each walk two or three more flights of stairs a day, we could reverse the obesity epidemic on average. You understand? So small changes in our built environment, and this also goes back to the neighborhood effects lecture we had about how the neighborhood around you can affect your health outcomes and your health um, experience. So signs and environmental nudges might work. And this might sound too optimistic as people might adapt to the signs and come to ignore them like cigarette uh, labels, right? Like eventually people still buy cigarettes. Um, although maybe some of them do buy less or some people, they're less prone to buy cigarettes because of the, you know, the awful labels. Remember, we saw some examples of that a few lectures ago. And there's still other modifications of structure that we can implement that might affect the well-being of individuals. Physically, I think this was assigned in your readings, physically, socially, and intellectually active lifestyles, it is believed, can slow cognitive decline. But the ability of aging individuals to maintain such an active lifestyle might depend on the levels of mobility that are enabled by the built environment. Making public transportation more affordable increases transport use and engagement among older people. In the United Kingdom, the older person's free bus pass, which was introduced in 2006. And did I assign this? Let me just check. You guys, this is where you should be jumping in and saying, oh yes, you did assign this. Yes, I did assign this. Okay, so you can help me out. If you did the reading, which you should have done, you would know that this was in your readings. Um, the older person's free bus pass, which was introduced in 2006, allows older adults to travel for free on public buses throughout the country. And this scheme provides a natural experiment to examine how a policy that encourages older people to use public transportation affects their cognitive function. And the policy led to an increase in public transport use, as well as higher levels of physical activity and social engagement, and lower levels of obesity, depressive symptoms, and loneliness. Right? We pass a law, we change the financial costs of moving around, older people go visit their relatives, visit their friends, walk to the bus stop, and so on, because we make it free. For example, social interaction and intellectually stimulating activities require the use of cognitive faculties, which according to the use it or lose it hypothesis has direct impacts on brain structure and function that protect against cognitive decline. And this figure taken from your readings shows mean cognitive scores according to, the, according to age for public transport users and non-users. Um, so, you know, what happens uh, with age uh, to your, your cognitive function if you're using the public transport uh, or not? And increased public transport use due to the free bus pass was associated with a 0 0.35 increase, a pointage, a point increase in the total, total cognitive function z-score, which is what's the measure on the, uh, on the, on the y-axis here. Or instead of paying doctors or relying on simple and cheap nudges, maybe we should actually just pay patients. Uh, this was another study from your readings, uh, the Volp study. This is a $750 incentive, was found to be effective and highly cost efficient uh, in this randomized control trial. What if we just pay people to quit smoking? I know that may sound really un-American. I mean, you know, why should I pay you to stop smoking, you dummy? I mean, you're smoking and killing yourself. But actually, your smoking is imposing a lot of costs on our society. Not just your death is bad for us, because we should care about all of our fellow citizens, but also, you know, in your smoking and becoming sick, you might do other things that harm other people. And actually $750 is not a lot of money to pay you to quit smoking. And they found in fact that with a study in the incentive group, they were three times more likely to, uh, to quit smoking a year later if you pay them $750. And in the case of smoking, in fact, we've used more than nudges or than mere signs. Maybe a, as we saw earlier, 
a few lectures ago, maybe a similar broad effort is needed for other uh, health problems. Maybe you know, we could have a multifactorial approach uh, to reducing tobacco use, which would involve all of these things, labels, taxes, clean air laws, sale, other laws against sales to minors, advertising restrictions, counter marketing and social movements. You know, maybe we should be deploying all of these policy interventions for other problems, not just uh, tobacco consumption. But perhaps some policies could actually approximate the removal of the handle on the Broad Street pump, so rad radically affecting structure that they actually cure the condition. Maybe there are some things when it comes to preventive health care that we can do that are like removing the handle on the Broad Street pump, that stop the cholera epidemic. Uh, you know, wouldn't that be amazing to actually have levers like that that we can deploy? So if we're serious about improving health, we must see that increased access to and use of medical care, however commendable a goal that is for pragmatic or moral reasons, is not the same thing as health promotion. Once again, insurance, healthcare use, and health are not the same thing. And in fact, medical care is not the same thing as health improvement. Our system does poorly when health and medicine differ, right? We just all these examples where people were using more doctors, but it didn't affect their health care. A better system would pay for health improvement rather than service provision, right? Pay for cure rather than just pay for care. Uh, if you pay someone to do stuff, they'll do it, but then maybe that doesn't have any benefit for the people. And the current system does not pay for many things that are of great value, right? Which you've seen by now uh, in this class. It's again, the problem of underinvestment in public goods. To the extent that we see public health as a public good, It'll reshape our attitudes towards what it's worth paying for um, and, and, uh, and how to pay for it. And it will, again, require ongoing collective action uh, to redress. That's all I have for you today. Does anyone have any questions for me before I let you go? Anyone else raise your hands? Yes, Danielle? I'm wondering. For the signs and also the nudges, have there been studies done on like whether seeing a sign in one mall will decrease your chances of using an elevator in another mall? Like these probably signs not for the signs, but there have probably been other nudges that have been looked at in terms of how they affect, you know, spill over and right. carry forward. Yeah. yeah, but they're all all going to have this problem that Liz identified of extinction, right? All educational event, uh, interventions extinguish. So I, I give you something you know, and uh, you really do it uh, because I, you know, incentivize you to do it, but then afterwards you, you stop after a while. So you need to be kind of re, you know, re-stimulated to, to do whatever it is that you're doing. Justin, I'm sorry, Joseph. Um, for the legislation um, incentives you talked about, um, is there like an all or nothing effect as in like if certain places implemented, it might counterintuitively worse than the underlying problem? How like a city that has a decriminalization of all drugs policy um, that incentivizes people who are more likely to do drugs in the city and people who are less likely to do And that, that counterintuitively increases drug overdoses because you just have a higher volume of drugs. Yes, it could. I mean, that's a good example, and I'm sure there are cases of that as well. Um, so you always have to define whenever you do public health interventions. And we saw this during COVID, and I think this was discussed in, in my book, Apollo Zero, about how, you know, across state lines, paradoxically, when you you, you had this weird, yeah, I did discuss this in the book. So you have this weird thing where like, if some states are very, have very stringent lockdowns and they lock down and you can't go to the grocery store or, or to some other kinds of stores, people will then drive across state lines to go to the other adjoining state, which doesn't have it. And actually paradoxically, that increases transmission of the virus by increasing population mobility. You would be better off having neither state have a lockdown than one state have a lockdown and one not, for example. And that was analyzed uh, during the COVID epidemic. So you really want like a kind of population-wide regime for many of these things. Now, of course, we have 50 states. We're not going to have national public health policy for some, for some things we do, uh, but not like, you know, like the drug, like the tobacco uh, advertising and so on. But for other things, we don't. And it could have these kinds of paradoxical effects that you allude to. So once again, you would have to be very utilitarian about it. Like I wouldn't want to decriminalize drug possession in this state if in the end it would lead to more deaths. Even though I'm generally in favor of decriminalization, I'm, you know, I, I wrestle with decriminalization of drugs. Uh, I, was, I was one of the people, this is 
when I was at the University of Chicago like 30 years ago who was, I testified in front of the United States Senate. I, I did a lot to try to uh, improve opioid availability in our society for, because I was caring for people who were dying. I don't know if I've told you these stories before. I did, yeah. And I, I really wrestled with, you know, did I play some small role in the fentanyl overdose epidemic? You know, because of my public advocacy for better care of the dying, I wanted to liberalize availability of opioids for people who actually needed them. But inter alia, then all these people who didn't need them started getting them too. And, you know, maybe there were more deaths as a result. Maybe we should have had more people dying in pain. That was a necessary price to pay to have fewer deaths. But my answer would be, let's do the study. And then we'll pick the policy, you know, very technocratic. That is best. That's one of the benefits is if you're, if you do public health in a relatively apolitical kind of utilitarian framework, you can pretty much be guided by these. Now, there'll be debate about whether you've done the calculations correctly, and they may not be clear. But you know, you you can kind of, I think, afford to be pretty utilitarian and less deontological in public health, at least in my opinion. Yes. Um, could you explain the like reducing like consumption by fifteen kilocalories a day reversing the obesity epidemic? Would that just be by shifting the entire curve to the left? Yes, the whole curve would shift. Uh, hold on. Uh, yes, the whole curve would shift if everyone ate less 15 calories per day. But the argument is, if you look at your weight gain over the next 30 years of your life, uh, you're going to gain like a pound a year or whatever you're going to gain. A typical one of you will gain a pound. That's you. I'm not picking on you. You'll gain a pound a year over the coming years. But to gain that extra pound, it's only a tiny amount of extra calories per day. If you literally reduce, you know, you eat 10 fewer French fries a day for the next year, you won't gain that pound. And if you do that year after year, you won't ever gain the extra 30 pounds. So that's the argument at a population level, that if we make the, the actual rise in obesity in our society has to do with very small increments in total food consumption. I think earlier in the course, relying on other people's estimates, I think it's like half a candy bar a day. Yeah. Literally, like a, an extra 100 calories a day is what's contributing if you do the calculations. Now, of course, there's asymmetry. Someone like Matt is, you know, crazy fit and, you know, he's not eating anything. Uh, but the, someone like me is, I mean, I'm eating two candy bars and he's eating none. On average, we're eating a candy bar, but I'm the one that's going to suffer. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so there'll be heterogeneity. Other questions? Okay, tomorrow, yes, so Justin. Just question. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I was just talking to myself, I don't, I'm really embarrassed. And one of you, we we're going to email you, Dorothy, you need to email the class. It's, it's either the fourth or the fifth, right? It is the fifth. Okay. It's on the fifth. Okay. So we will triple confirm that and Dorothy will send an email to the whole class today uh, confirming the exam. I think it's at the two o'clock time slot. And how, did we confirm how long it is? Dorothy will also let every three and a half hours. It's a three and a half hour time slot. Yes. I torture you for three and a half hours. No, I'm not going to torture you for three and a half hours. I, I, I'm going to design an exam that may even take two or two and a half hours, and I'll let you have the whole time if you want it, but you, you won't really need it. And, uh, and, uh, and the exam will be, I, I don't think, I'm, I told some of you earlier, I'm not going to give you blue books because it creates logistical problems for us to grade. So they're going to be printed, they'll be very similar in appearance to the questions you, exams you've had so far, but I probably won't have one question per page. It'll be one question every other page, so you have extra space to write out your stuff. Or maybe I'll put all the questions on the first page and give you blank sheets. I haven't decided. Uh, and there'll be some rules to make it easier for us to disassemble your exams and stuff like that and grade them more systematically. Uh, so please follow those rules. Yeah. Uh, would it be possible to find out what the grade boundary is off? Or like how the numbers would... How what? Like the numbers we've got on our midterms, what they would look like as grades. So, uh, so we grade the exams blindly and we try strictly to do it. We have rubrics, like we have, we create rubrics for what counts and then we try to deduct points fairly across everyone. And then, uh, then we have a calculation as is in the syllabus, you know, I think 40% on the final and 25% for each of the midterms. And we do the whole calculation and then I'm a little gentle at the end. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't promise to do that. Previous students, I have, I have, I can't remember a time when I felt students felt like they were treated unfairly. Uh, but I do expect you to do the work, as you see. I expect you to do the readings and come to class and follow the lectures. And you know me by now, and you can imagine the kinds of, and the questions that you'll see on the final won't be as short. They'll be a bit more macro. There's going to be a question on structure and agency. 
there could be a question on methodological individual. I mean, like okay. asking you to synthesize what's happening. I might, a typical thing of me, and I haven't written the final yet, would be to take something in the news from the last week and say, read this passage and now analyze it using the knowledge you have.